Cool. Okay. So while we are setting up our live stream on Facebook also, but I'll finish that in a, in a bit, I would like to welcome everybody to another Crypto Wednesday. And we have got some really special guests today, and we are uh, live streaming from all over the world in different uh, locations. So before we get started, this is another Crypto Wednesday. This is our show number nine already. We are really excited together with my co-host and friend, Gordon Einstein. We have another, yeah, yeah how do I say, big uh, a team of guest speakers who are our guests today and sharing their latest insights on what's happening in today's world in the crypto and blockchain in the industry. And before we get started, for everybody listening to... Oh, just need to mute there. Very good. So for everybody that's joining the live stream, thank you for joining. If there's anything you would like to address, ask to the guest speakers. Please put your questions in the chat box so we can take a look and forward them and bring them to the conversation during our live stream. You're more than help, uh, happy to, uh, to ask us really interesting questions. Um, and if there's anything else you would like to bring to the table, yeah, please use the, the chat box. In the meantime, we will keep all the other videos uh, closed so you can focus on the, on the guest speakers. I think that's it from, the, let's say, the, the house uh, rules that, that we have. We're really excited. We have a couple of really great uh, guest speakers. But before we introduce them, because I would like to ask them one by one to is introduce themselves before I make any uh, misspell in their uh, names because they have some difficult names all over. So maybe I go first to my co-host, Gordon. Welcome to the show, my friends. I'm curious because I see you in a very well environment. Where in the world are you this week, Gordon? So this week, so after being in quarantine lockdown in Los Angeles, I finally broke out after getting a molecular PCR test. And I am now in beautiful Dubrovnik, Croatia with my family. And this has been awesome. Uh, I really love Croatia. This is my first time here. Uh, I'm happy to be here with one of our co-panelists who we'll introduce in a moment. Uh, and behind me is a very nice beach scene. So there's some ambient noise. So you know, normally I do a lot of talking during these shows. I think I'll mute myself, not my guests, but I'll mute myself selectively just so you don't have to hear all the pina coladas being made. But yes, from, from Dubrovnik. So cool. Very happy to be here. Wow, that, that, that sounds like a good, good location. So maybe we, maybe we can start with our, with our speakers. I would like to ask Luca first to introduce himself a little bit. And uh, Lu Luca, how do we pronounce your name correctly? Uh, Luca Sucic, that's my name. Last I, mean, I know everybody's, having, everybody's gonna have issues with all of us because we all have this weird uh, uh, signs in our, in our surname. So uh, my name is Luca Sucic. I'm, um, first off, thank you so much for having uh, me on the show and together with the, the rest of the colleagues, thanks you for selecting Croatia as your holiday destination. Well, Gordon at least, uh, or his wife. Uh, uh yeah i'm um i don't know uh shortly about me currently uh up until very recently i was uh working for um alternative blockchain but now i started uh, together with a couple of colleagues i started a new fund that's going to focus on uh, blockchain crypto uh across the world that's me and let's hear it from the others cool Th thank you luca and I, I think these are a couple of your friends right that you also invited to join today's crypto program. scene is Crypto scene is very small in Croatia, so basically everybody knows everyone here. So this is kind of the you know the the guys who were available and who did something notable in the in the scene and uh, agreed to to kind of meet us. So yeah, <laughs> we're all kind cool. of friends. Cool. And let me point out, yes, Luca was key. You know, I I love how the crypto tribe works because before this trip to Croatia, I put out on social media. You know, who knows people in Croatia? Luca ended up being the nexus of all things. So if you, if you want to know what the, what the center of, you know, ho hopefully other, hopefully everyone else on the panel will not, you know, you know, will support him and not be like, hey, brother, what, you know, what are you stealing the glory here? But that's the sun, by the way. But, you know, Luca was very helpful in introducing us to these other fine members of the Croatian crypto community. So, Luca, we want to thank you very much for doing that and for being on this panel. We did a pre-show pre with you because your background is so interesting with the turn in the, in what you're doing now. Um, so just... Thanks, we appreciate it. But then, Sandra, let's go on. I hand it back to you. 
I, I, I was going to ask Luca because Luca invited some of the sure. friends, and, and like like yeah. we said, the, the the industry is very small and tight, and we are all well well connected to each other. So Luca, in just in random order, can you can you pick up and sure. just introduce one of the the friends that you got into the call also? Let's start with Vlaho maybe because he's uh, there with Gordon, uh, native of Dubrovnik. He is our uh, uh, beloved president, the president of the Croatian Blockchain and Cryptocurrency Association. A crypto lawyer like Gordon and uh, I don't know, the guy that you want to call when you uh, end up in trouble, at least in, in the tech sector. So Vlaho maybe a couple of uh, you know words from, from you I think would be notable. I didn't hear the oh, okay. So Vlaho. Wow. It's a little bit loud here. We have ambient noise. So, Vlaho, say hello. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I was. Uh, I'm. I am a Dubrovnik native, but I also happen to spend summers here. Although I live in Zagreb, and was currently spending some time with my wife and kid, uh, some 40 kilometers from here in Stone. Uh, so I took the chance to uh, to participate live. So. So right now, contribute. Right now, he's suffering at the beautiful Valamar Hotel. Yeah. We all are. Are, yeah. It's terrible. <laughs> yep. And, and this Thank is you, Marina. Marina. Hi, Marina. Suffering, suffering and about to go to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, uh, Luca, passing it back to you. Sure. So, uh, but together with us, we have also Eddie, Eddie Sinovic. Uh, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, but maybe you should introduce yourself really shortly so I don't need to. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Luca. Uh, yeah, it's Edi Sinovic. Uh, usually people call me Edi or Eddie or whatever. I I just reply to everything. Basically, I consider myself, a, I'm a software developer or builder and I'm working part-time for Ethereum Foundation and part-time on some project that we have in a company. And basically, I'm leading a team of six like crypto hackers. We like to call ourselves hackers and we are doing that from Croatia and building for the decentralized world. That's basically it, in short. Awesome. Shall I continue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead. Okay. So, so let's. Good, you know, uh -huh. it's nice not to have to run the show and to have someone else do it. So go for it. Keep going. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Tsuke comes to let's. We have Nikolas Koric joining us somewhere in the middle of the Adriatic Sea. I, ha I think he has the best uh, view. And I think he has the best, um, you know, location from all of us. Uh, so, hi, Nikola. Uh, maybe wave us around so hi, we, see hi. The, we see the location. I think everybody's getting a little bit jealous. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce very shortly, or you want to introduce yourself, Nico? Sushats. We have like a few nautical miles to, to sail to uh, to Sushats and then onwards to, to Last of War or Koshua. We'll decide. So, yeah, sorry about that. Um, I. Um, I unfortunately am not in my office, so you'll have to um, um, you have to uh, live with my bad reception and great image. Uh, so yeah, um, I'm um, founder of Electrocoin, which is um, Croatia's biggest crypto brokerage and uh, payment processor. We've been in business since 2014, um, basically, uh, uh, yeah, running the big. Is the biggest uh, brokerage here here in Croatia, making it simple for people to buy and sell crypto, and in the last few years also to, to spend crypto in Croatia. Cool, Th thank you, uh, Nicola. And, and I agree, uh, Luca. I think uh, Nicola is in the in the one of the best positions from all the speakers today. So some of us are indoors. We see Gordon and Val uh, on a, on a nice terrace, and Nicola on, on on the sea. So that all looks good. And maybe as a, li a little preview for, for next week, Gordon, you don't even know this yet, but next week I will be coming live from Portugal. The south of Ooh. Portugal will be in Faro. So I will, I will search for a really cool location so to, uh, to, hard to, to match. On, the, on the Crypto Wednesday. But yeah, hard too much. There, there are a lot of, of course, good, good environments. So maybe Gordon, uh, for the people that, know, that don't know you, you know, you're, you're, you're the founder partner uh, of uh, Crypto Law Partners. Maybe you give a little introduction on yourself also for the people that don't know you yet. I'll, do, I'll keep it very brief just because the show ain't about me, but I'm a lawyer who actually left law and went back into it because of crypto. So most lawyers try to get out of law and then they stay out of law. You know, some lawyers are smart and get into crypto like when they're babies, you know, but I, I actually escaped from law and then went back into law because the Bitcoin bug grabbed me in well, let me put it this way. It, it, I got a little bit of the Bitcoin bug in 2014, 
and I went all in in 2016. So I can't say I'm an original gangster, but you know, I just, I love it. And so my entire practice involves working with crypto and blockchain companies on an international basis, which is, Sandra, why I'm happy to be doing this international show with you. Um, so let, let me propose, we, we, now that we got the brief intros from our guests, let, I want to take them one at a time, if I may. Yeah, sure, sure, let's go. L Luca, we're going we're gonna to start with you. Sure, shoot. And, you know, I, I think all of you are, if I understand correctly, Croatian natives. Just tell us, a, give, give us a little bit more about your background, about your, what you did before for Bitcoin, because I thought that was interesting and what, you know, what your parents wanted you to do, and what they wanted you not to do. You know, how and when did Bitcoin grab you? How did you get involved in eternity, eternity blockchain? And what are you doing now? All in one minute. No, just kidding. Okay, 30 yeah. seconds or less. Uh, Starting with your education and where you were sure. born and all So that. basically I'm born in Croatia. Uh, I was basically, um, it's it, it's really funny. My my father, because I like to talk and argue, he always wanted to. He proposed that I become a lawyer, and I studied law for a couple of years. When I, before I realized uh, this is horrible, and you know I will end my life in misery eternal if I continue like this. And then I switched uh, basically sides because it just didn't fit my uh, my I don't know um, character. So I switched uh, to to things that I enjoy the most, which I enjoy the most. What uh, uh, was was uh, basically economy uh, in general, business in general. And I started like I was uh, when I was a kid. I was I was uh, living close to the border and I was smuggling, uh, you know, stuff just buying stuff uh, across the border in Slovenia where they were cheaper and selling them back in in Croatia. And this is how I kind of you know kind of got the feel for you know you buy for one uh, and you sell for two. That's the simplest, most simplest way of you know doing business. Uh, but anyhow, um, I was basically uh, uh, an entrepreneur. I had many, many startups. Uh, most of them failed. Uh, some of them were kind of profitable. Some of them were, uh, most of them were not so profitable. But uh, basically, it helped me to learn immense, like really a lot of things. Uh, and like if you look at my LinkedIn profile, I would like I'm I'm kind of embarrassed to put all of the things that I've done there. So I just you know use a selection. But for the past, I don't know, like 20 years, I've been building stuff uh, left and right. And um, I'm kind of um, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but I'm usually the most experienced ones. I screwed up like so many times, so I know exactly what to avoid if you don't want to fail. Um, I somehow ended up back in 2000. 11 or 12 can't remember in a big corporation in in, uh, in in creation telecom part of deutsche telecom back then um and i was planning to stay for a year but i stayed for almost almost nine years or eight years something like this and i was uh, mostly working with the startups in the last three <laughs> somehow I, nine have, years? I think it got nine almost, years uh, i think maybe may, maybe less eight years or something like this like things blend <laughs> with me something like this so um yeah, and uh, somewhere along these lines, but like when I w w always when I was working somewhere, I had like one or two projects juggling uh, alongside. So this was uh, crypto uh, back then. I got introduced uh, uh, to crypto so to a friend of mine. You know, it was like this magical internet monopoly money that didn't wasn't worth, worth that much. But I really got into that. Um, I think it was back in two thousand. 13 or 14, not sure, uh, when basically it was a big crisis in the Cyprus and uh, there was a lot of, let's say, bad things happening from the sides of the bank, especially what, what happens, uh, people nationalize completely the, 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 the savings of people. And a friend uh, who was living in Cyprus back then, and I was uh, basically mentioned him like, look, you, you should look, look into Bitcoin if you want to move some funds from, from, from there. So I don't know, I just basically have felt that uh, Bitcoin back then was a uh, kind of a free, I don't know, a little bit of a, this idealistic free type of money that nobody can kind of, uh, you know, um, take away from you and you can do whatever you want with it. And I was kind of trying to rage because I was kind of feeling a little bit cornered within a corporation. So I don't know, I got really, really uh, into that. And yeah, I mean, uh, let me ask you, there was a little bit of background music here for a moment. Did you, did you talk about that thing where you got access to the GPUs? And the, the, you told me you really need anecdote. I don't want. I don't want to spoil it. But you had access okay. to GPUs. 
and then you learn something using someone else's GPUs? Ah, uh, yeah. So uh, that was my friend. So I had a friend who was uh, into security and basically he had a, a password uh, hashing rig. So basically, um, you know, a, a, a computer that he used to break passwords and I borrowed it for him. Basically, I convinced him to lend it to me uh, because I wanted to use it for something. He didn't know what exactly. He said, okay, here, you can use it. Well, I'm not using it. You just need to pay for electricity. This is how I got into um, uh, Bitcoin mining back then. And we mined some, like, uh, we mined some non-trivial amounts, uh, <laughs> but it was worthless back then. It was just uh, kind of a play. It was, uh, I was just very curious about, you know, all of these things uh, happening around that. It was like, 2000, I think, 13 or something, like even 20, uh, 2020, uh, 2012, maybe. So, uh, but electricity was very expensive. I had no idea how much that, you know, that rig could, uh, you know, uh, cost in electricity. So this is how I ended up initially. Yeah. And, and keep going. So, yeah, so, so basically, I, how did I, like, I, basically, I want the entire FBI dossier on your background. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there's, here. yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of background stories in the in, in the meantime because I rarely did one thing. Uh, I always did like multiple things at the same time because I don't know. It was just uh, too curious. So at one point in time, I met this guy while I was traveling around. I think Central and Southeast Europe. I think it was either Romania or Bulgaria. I met this guy, a really cool guy, uh, long hair, like very I don't know, very looked very smart. And this guy showed me a physical Bitcoin. And was like, oh, and he was back then one of the maybe like two or three people that knew that, that I could physically talk to that knew something about Bitcoin. And we got, you know, we started talking. Um, this guy was basically building cool stuff back then um, that ended up being the founder of uh, Eternity back in 2017. And he basically, we stayed in contact and, uh, you know, I was helping him with some side projects he had a little bit. And uh, I ended up, like deciding after my last thing, I decided to go full in crypto. So early 2018, I decided like, I want to make a, like my career is going to be in crypto. I don't want to go back to a corpo. I don't want to, you know, build something else. I just want to go full, full throttle in this. And this is where I joined Eternity. Uh, basically the, the, the Eternity blockchain. And then I've done many, many crazy cool stuff with, together with the guys. And this is, this is, this was basically up until two months ago. I mean, we're we're still part of the, the the ecosystem, but now in a completely different format, together with uh, with uh, with a couple of partners, most notably Nicola, the the, the, one of the, the other co-founders of Eternity. We're 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 launching a fund that is going to focus on blockchain startups, mostly emerging markets, but you know, disruptive business models mostly. So that's me. That's my history and background. You know, from like what two and a half minutes. Wow, that's, well well done. Okay, so the current your deep deep involvement with the Eternity blockchain with, and current project is now MetaChange Capital. Yes. Look at the impact exactly. project. Love it. Sorry? I said your current project is MetaChange Capital looking to make an impact through yes. blockchain, crypto, and reworking governance, if I recall correctly. Exactly. Exactly. That's the, that's the idea. Love it. Okay. So let's now pass to Eddie. Eddie, you know, again, let's give us the security services version of your life, you know, born and then, you know, how it all progressed. Sure. Go, go for it. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm also Croatian native, basically born in Split, uh, was basically whole my childhood here until the college when I moved to, to Zagreb, the capital where I finished basically the master in computer science. Uh, in that time, I worked basically as Java developer, you know, the enterprise applications, automotive industry and stuff like that. And that was like 2017 when I found about this thing called Archain, which was basically mentioned to be Ethereum killer, another one, you know, like, like they all are. And I got interested because like you build this all boring applications every day, which, you, are, you know, are meant to be used for this corporate clients and they earn money on that and nothing gets distributed. I was quite the, uh, idealistic back then, to be honest, with the crypto and everything. And I found it. Oh, like, no, no, hold on. I, I can't let that go. You're idealistic back then. I'm, I'm still. You were born in 93. But, so now you're like Mr. Cynical? 
yeah <laughs> well yeah yeah kind of yeah but sure but back okay. then that crypto you know the the blockchain should, yeah like in my mind it, it was a solution for everything today i'm aware that it's not for everything but yeah there are some like field that can be so with that so basically on to that uh, i joined the r chain as a part of the community we built some stuff there but due to some governance stuff in that happened inside of it i got disappointed some money got you know went away to some murky stuff so let's let's just say that and then i moved on basically started freelancing full-time uh, doing uh, different ethereum projects for clients and so on and that's when i also contribute to the remix project solve some issues and stuff like that and the guys gave me an opportunity on the socrates project the idea was to use the socrates which is basically zk this is a framework for zk snarks on ethereum support it from a silly eye tool to the remix and basically we did that in like three months of work we almost like two of us were coding like day and night and we managed to do that uh, till devcon and we presented it basically on devcon from that onwards, basically, the colleague Darko that was doing that with me is now part of the Socrates team full time. And now switch to Sourceify project, which is the idea behind that is currently when you communicate with a specific address on chain via MetaMask, for example, you, you have some, uh, for example, if you want some details, you have some bytecode, which is not human readable. Our idea is to verify all the smart contracts or like the, the most used ones. And when you interact basically with some address on chain, you will be able to see the actual contract behind that and metadata so you can verify that you're actually communicating with some specific a uh, specific contract that you want to. So basically just improvement on user experience. And basically I'm, I'm on that team since January working almost full time basically there. And that's most like my story now with Ethereum and everything and building, you know, stuff. Also on the other part, I have the lead of the Shard Labs. It's basically a blockchain custom development company. We are like mostly building uh, stuff on top of Ethereum and, you know, doing consultancy and stuff like that. How can like existing systems be used on the blockchain? Why I said that I'm less idealistic now because I believe that blockchain is a solution for everything. Now I believe that blockchain has specific use cases that are really good and in our, our improvement, but I wouldn't push it to to all of the use cases definitely. Like it was pushed like 2017. You're not, you're not like morally compromised, or at least you're not morally compromised about that. You just don't think like blockchain will solve COVID tomorrow or something. Yeah, but there are people that believe that and there are COVID token solutions and I, it's sure, like I, I really believe that there shouldn't be any maximalism and I, is my opinion is just one opinion. So like there are different peoples that are breaking stuff and that's why we are called hackers. You know, we are hacking this thing, trying to improve it. And like with this DeFi revolution, who saw that coming? You know, there were some people hacking it and then just exploded, you know, and that's great. You know, it doesn't mean that some some uh, area is interesting to me, but it's interesting to some other people. And, and that's that's awesome. That's what, what this decentralized system are like and uh, what, basically it gives to us we can do whatever we want and nobody can can uh, prevent us and well let me, let me let me throw this at you so <laughs> one, one of our earlier shows was about DeFi. we had a uh, tom howard mm -hmm. and pablo kravchenko is that i mean is that really a to me to me that belongs within the overall blockchain crypto family of things not necessarily a new independent thing but yeah, but I, I don't necessarily know what, what's your point of view yeah, definitely. That's basically a bunch of smart contracts that people can use. To, you know, you 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 provide the liquidity. You can you get interest on that. Like usually, that wasn't that that was like mainstream before the DeFi and the whole revolution. So yeah, not to go too technical. Basically, uh, it's it's part. It's built on Ethereum. Basically, like most of the solutions that are used now. But there are also some other blockchains that could be used for this. So you know, that's. That's always like when you, the traction is on Ethereum, that's why it's used and that's how I work on Ethereum because I think it's the best. But if some other people are working on something else, I like to to point that out. It's not that they're mistaken or I'm correct or something like that. So just just to just to say that. Fair enough. And by the way, Vlaho, um, he's gonna rejoin from the road. So I didn't scare him away, I promise. And it wasn't the view. <laughs> uh, okay. Nicola, the, 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 the man with the best background, you know, we, we took a poll and you definitely have the best background. Tell us, you know, I think you're the first nuclear engineer we've had on the show. So were you born a nuclear <laughs> engineer or? 
Maybe not yeah, uh, I, I, uh, yeah, I, um, uh, first, uh, regarding my reception, uh, if it gets uh, jumpy, just simply mute me and, and go on. Uh, sorry about this, but this, this is the best I can do. So, yeah, uh, I, um, I must say that I always wanted to be a nuclear physicist. I did that in, in my, my uh, middle school diploma was, uh, my middle school paper was in, um, uh, uh, elementary particles. So, yeah, I always wanted to be a nuclear engineer, a nuclear physicist, but uh, my other passion was computer science and, uh, yeah, uh, basically it's easier to make a living as, as a computer scientist than as a nuclear physicist. So I uh, graduated uh, from computer science, uh, I graduated in computer science for from uh, University of Zagreb, uh, some, oh, it's almost 15 years ago now. Uh, but yeah, somehow I, um, I eventually ended up in, uh, in nuclear because uh, I worked in the nuclear power plant for 10 years, which is some um, 40 kilometers from, from Zagreb. But um, while uh, building my um, dream career in nuclear, I still um, I kept in touch with my, um, with my basically uh, diploma thesis, which was uh, cryptography because I graduated in, in the field of cryptography and sometime in 2011 uh, on a number of mailing lists and uh, news groups I, I was following uh, about cryptography, I, um, uh, I ran into Bitcoin uh, and uh, into Bitcoin white paper, read it and uh, got, got really blown out of the water by the way that Satoshi solved um, basically distributed consensus problem. Uh, it was from the technical point, it was really, really, really interesting to read about that. And for me, that was more or less it because I didn't have the investment uh, angle uh, and the investment mindset. So I tried uh, to buy my first Bitcoin in 2013, just, you know, to play with it a bit. Uh, and I figured it's, uh, I figured out that it's really, really hard to buy crypto, uh, to buy Bitcoin from Croatia at that point and started uh, offering the service to, to other people because I figured out how to do it uh, easily. It, it had to do with opening bank accounts in Slovenia and stuff like that. So yeah, that's how I started to do uh, and, basically. And dare, I, dare I mention you had a early experience with Mt. Gox? Yeah, yeah. I bought my first Bitcoin, uh, first one hundred dollars of worth of Bitcoin at Mount Gox, and then, then I just left it there, uh, and it's still there somewhere. Uh, yeah, it was it wasn't much, uh, but uh, yeah, I figured that you know buying uh, at Mount Gox and selling at local Bitcoins here in Croatia, uh, you can turn a, a decent profit. So you know why not do that as. Uh, as a side thing and then it grew exponentially from there in a few months at the start of 2014 i had to open a company to do it to, to do it properly and this opened the whole pandora box of issues that resulted in in uh us starting a cryptocurrency association a few years later because we i started you know sending letters to, to regulators and asking them um you know what should i do that was fun. Uh, I think they, they laughed a lot when they received those those letters, uh, emails uh, about cryptocurrency, which was, uh, Actually, which was let, me, let me ask you, and this is a good question for Lau when he gets back on. Did they, you know, you say, you say they laughed. Did they respond? Yeah, they responded, like, do whatever. We don't care. Uh, we don't regulate that, uh, whatever it is. That was basically the, the response, and I think this was a blessing right uh, right then because we were able to start a company and run a company for a few years uh, without basically any uh, regulation. Uh, if we started the company in the U.S., uh, we would have you know we would need capital. I basically started the company with a few thousand euros of seed capital, and then it just grew, grew organically. We didn't have any. Uh, outside investment at all, uh, and this was all due uh, to us not having to invest in uh, in uh, uh, compliance department. This all changed on 1st of January of this year uh, when Croatia implemented uh, anti-money laundering directive, European Union's uh, fifth anti-money laundering directive, and it was this was basically the perfect uh, time uh, for us for this uh, legislation to come into effect because uh, we finally could afford uh, really good. Uh, compliance department uh, and now we are 
you're basically f fully regulated in the field of uh, money laundering, which I think uh, is good because it's now now it's much easier to find find bank accounts and find uh, partners. So yeah, to uh, to pick off where I uh, left, uh, so it was 2014 that the company was started. In September, I was joined by my partner Marin, who also graduated in the field of uh, cryptography and who also picked up uh, cryptocurrencies along the way. Uh, and he was he still is one of the Croatia's uh, premium uh, uh, cybersecurity experts. So we were the, basically the the match made in heaven uh, because my, my uh, in, in the nu in nuclear power plant I got some uh, project management experience and uh, safety first mindset that allow us to, to survive through through the crypto for the you know crypto volatility uh, then then a few years uh, later uh, let, me, let me ask a question I, I, I take it upon myself to rudely interrupt at any time it, no problem so it just occurred to me to ask you since you're involved in nuclear power I know it's a random question, but what do you think about the energy consumption requirements of proof of work? Yeah, I think um, that is uh, that is a problem that's being solved. Uh, solving so the Satoshi in in his white paper solved a really, really, really hard problem of distributed consensus. That's an issue that's been on the table for as long as there are computer networks and even, and even longer than that. Uh, and to solve that problem was really hard. And he solved it in, uh, now we can say, a bit inefficient way. Uh, it uh, consumes a lot of electricity, but uh, you know he solved the problem. And now uh, some other really, really smart guys are trying to improve on that, and they are improving. Uh, and in a few years, I'm sure that uh, this problem will be solved. Uh, uh, Ethereum 2.0 looks like um, like a decent uh, decent shot in that in that direction. So yeah, I think uh, that energy consumption on proof of proof of work is really uh, an issue, but it's an issue that's being worked on, and uh, I think it's going to be solved uh, in uh, in in a few years uh, quite uh, quite nicely. Do you, do you think it'll be solved in the Bitcoin ecosystem? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't know, because uh, uh, the problem solving part uh, involves a lot of um, community deciding and um, Bitcoin has, doesn't have a good track record in, uh, in community building. Uh, it has definitely more forks than, uh, than Ethereum has. Uh, why Ethereum Classic is still a thing is is a bit beyond me. Ethereum seems to have a really good decision making process. While there, are, you know, in top ten, there are three uh, Bitcoin. So basically, uh, the original Bitcoin Core and two different Bitcoin forks. I think uh, this uh, tells a lot about uh, decision making processes in Bitcoin and its uh, its trouble in uh, overcoming the proof of work. Um, energy consumption issues. So, uh, yeah, I'm not quite optimistic, but uh, yeah, let's let's uh, let's be surprised by Bitcoin. Fair enough. Okay, and then uh, keep on going. I think I cut you off in 2016, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so we uh, for the whole this period we've been growing uh, growing exponentially. So in 2017, uh, our company had five, six, seven people, something like that. So I had to decide if I want to run <laughs> a crypto a crypto brokerage or I want to be a nuclear engineer and I decided for uh, for the former. So I quit, uh, quit my uh, beloved nuclear uh, engineer career and focused on the crypto full time. Um, in 2000, so in 2016, we started operating in European Union also, in a wider European Union. So today, that's some 80% of our volumes, 20% is in Croatia, and uh, our European Union share is basically growing all the time. It's growing faster than, than our market share in Croatia. Uh, in 2018, uh, we started um, uh, the, our cryptocurrency uh, payment processor project called PaySec. Uh, and in December, we had our first uh, client, which was Children's Hospital in Croatia. We run a crypto. Uh, we run a crowdfunding campaign to buy to buy uh, some equipment for them, and uh, half of that, half of the funds collected, some seven and a half 
thousand uh, euros were collected as cryptocurrency through our crypto pay, cryptocurrency payment processor. Uh, so through 2019, we uh, we improved uh, uh, PaySec and figure out that the best way to uh, to allow people to spend crypto was basically to integrate crypto everything into everything into the existing infrastructure. So uh, first, what we did was we integrated crypto in creation post. So now you can uh, you you can uh, sell crypto for uh, Croatian kunas in 55 offices of Croatian Post. Uh, next, what we did uh, is we integrated crypto into fiscal registers. So every point of sale in Croatia has to have by law a uh, fiscal register, which is basically uh, an application allowing you to print uh, print the receipts. So we started uh, integrating our our our. The payment processor into those uh, into those services. We are currently integrated with four different services, and we aim to uh, to finish uh, finish this year uh, with covering maybe some 40 to 50 percent of uh, of point of sale um, uh, locations with uh, with ability to accept crypto. Uh, what we did next in 2020, we integrated with physical exchanges uh, in Croatia, which is a big thing here since we are a tourist country and there is uh, you can buy and sell euros and dollars for Kuna uh, on every corner in Croatia. So we integrated with the uh, In Capital, which is um, a first a physical uh, uh, Exchange where, aside from euros and dollars, you can now buy and sell uh, Ethereum and and Bitcoin. So yeah, uh, this is basically where we are, where we are right now. We are trying to make it. Uh, so we started uh, with a mission to try and uh, make buying and selling crypto as easy as possible, and now we are trying to integrate uh, to, to to make it uh, as easy as possible to use crypto in in everyday life. life. Uh, and we are using Croatia as our sandbox, and then slowly, uh, as we um, evaluate our new services, move them into the wider European Union scene. Which is that's the fantastic. Thank you. That's a fantastic lead in to the next topic, I guess. Which I, I'm going to open up to the panel in, in general. And Luca, you're going to you're going to lead this one. I see you nodding. I see you checking your mobile. Luca, you're with me, buddy. You're my co-host. So let's let's talk you, about buddy. Croatia from. You, you all kind of led into it. Let's talk about it from a national and a regulatory and a community perspective. So how your projects have benefited or not benefited from being here, what, what road you followed. Blaho, good. We're, we're going to come back to you in a moment, but you're going to be part of this conversation. The, the, the question is, what is Croatia like as a jurisdiction? Not just legally, not just regulatory, from your, from your personal experiences, from the community, the crypto, and Luca, I'm actually going to pass it to you. Sure. I, you so, know, I, oh, and I get to sit back favorite. and drink water. So go for it. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go into a fight, a huge fight here, because uh, I think it's a as a jurisdiction is horrible. It's basically. Um, I don't think that the people know what they're doing. You have a lot of good people with good intentions, but the system itself is kind of broken. Uh, and uh, in the case of Nikola or in the case of Ubik, uh, um, like people think they know what they're doing in, in terms of, um, in terms of um, let's say regulating it or even understanding it. The AML5, the, the anti-money laundering, the first version that came out in Croatia was an, a appalling thing which showed people that they have no clue what blockchain is or they don't understand crypto and basically it was kind of shut down really 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 fast and thankfully some smart people came to the rescue and kind of stopped that because it would effectively kill any kind of crypto or blockchain mm. involvement in Croatia at the same time you have Slovenia which is a smaller country and they were one of the I think top three countries in, in, in Europe uh, that had, during the ICO craze of 2017, they had, the, I don't know, like a massive, massive amount of money being poured into the country just because somebody kind of regulated it properly. Croatia was kind of... Uh, I was saying, so because someone regulated it properly, you said? Um, in Slovenia? Yeah. In Slovenia, basically, the, not regulated properly. So basically, they had a fortunate incident. Nobody did this intentionally. I think they also did it completely accidentally. It was a like a very nice way, a loophole to for for people to be able to raise money through the crowdfunding because Slovenia was very big into crowdfunding through Kickstarter. So basically, they used this loophole to start raising uh, money through tokens. And as a consequence of this, you know, a lot of companies went to Slovenia. 
even from Croatia, you know, you, you know, in the in the neighboring countries, everybody went to Slovenia, but then they changed the law again, and then basically basically killed everything as a consequence of this. I don't know. Maybe we can, you know, we can follow up with with Vlaho because I know Vlaho has a very very distinct opinion about the, uh, you know, the overall climate in in Croatia when it comes to crypto, when it comes to blockchain in in, in general. Vlaho, what's your take? Are we? Well, is Croatia... Vlaha, give, Vlaha, give us a little bit of your background because yeah. unfortunately we missed you before, yeah. but you, yeah. you're. I think the one of the first you're the only crypto attorney I know in Croatia, which is awesome. So uh, I, I, I think I can one start out of two. One, one out of two, yeah. Well, I can start with that. Uh, first of all, sorry I moved from Gordon because I had a private thing to attend to. So now I'm at no my worries, no worries, no worries. Appreciate bad. you being on. Yeah, uh, well, uh, to be honest, the, the problem with with lawyers uh, is probably why look I didn't quit law school is uh, that we are sometimes too uptight. And uh, the, the, they, what they teach you through four or five years to, of law school is to always try to maintain the status quo no matter what. So it's always your instinct is to say no rather than say, let's see what we can do about it. So the problem with crypto, when I got into it, uh, I, there wasn't anyone I could ask uh, about uh, like how to be a crypto lawyer. I had to invent it myself and I, I don't even know if I'm good at it. I'm just winging it still. Uh, the, the other thing is, uh, once 2017 uh, hype came to its uh, peak, like end of the year, I started getting a lot of phone calls and emails from uh, big law offices in Croatia. And they were quite shy and they were approaching me like, with like, sorry, could we have a meeting? Like we were also interested in doing crypto and so on. I went to a couple of those meetings and they, they, they literally thought I was holding some sort of a monopoly on uh, on being a crypto lawyer in Croatia. And I said, like, I, 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 I can't, not that I don't, not that I don't want to stop you. I can't stop you. And I'm looking forward to it. You know, it's like game theory. The more of us, the scene will boom and so on and so on. And I shared literally every piece, every document, every template, everything I ever got that could be useful for a lawyer who wants to turn himself into, let's call it crypto lawyer or doing blockchain. And this one company even wanted to do, I, I think Nicola will re remember like a crypto breakfast for, for their clients. And then as soon as Bitcoin started losing its value, it was over. Like no one ever contacted me and I didn't see anyone doing anything much. I'm still very pro, uh, like I want to be collegial. I want to help them do it, but I really don't have any more input. There are some younger kids uh, finishing uh, law school. They, they, they are interested in it, in it, but there still isn't uh, like a law, a law scene or a law, law community that would be interested in technologies. Because one of the things I, I told on these meetings was like, but you have to you know, understand technology as well. You can't just be lawyers who write about technology. And that's where I lost m m most of them. And to the other part, uh, what Luca told me about my distinct opinion, uh, I think Croatia is getting better. I think one of the things that I'm proud of uh, for starting Ubik is that we actually did get to some sort of common ground with the regulators. Because when we started, the only thing, uh, I was at a meeting where the head of uh, this particular part of the text office in Croatia said, yeah, yeah, I know crypto and everything, but let, uh, I'll just tell you, when you say crypto, we think money laundering. So that was where we started. And now we are considered, I think, um, at least a partner when, when they're, when they're uh, thinking of doing uh, some new regulation or to trying to introduce some uh, some new rules of conduct, they at least consult us. And uh, I really don't want to be condescending, but when, when we went to these lawyers, uh, to these meetings, sorry, uh, the, the legal people from tax administration and people who met us, they it's not that, that they didn't want to help, they just didn't know that much. And one of the ladies told me like, she, she almost started the sentence with a, with son, but she didn't. Like I'm 60. Uh, the only money I know is you know kuna money, physical money, and you're talking about some tokens, some ICO, some like. She wanted to say, don't get me wrong, but I can't. You can't expect me to understand this. But they wanted to, which was really important because they were taking notes and we were we were trying to explain things, and that's why I think the scene is not that bad. And recently, finally, uh, recently I've had a question from. A, couple of young guys wanting to start a company saying like, what's the best jurisdiction in, in Europe? And I said Croatia, which is definitely a lie. But uh, I just wanted to tell them it's not that bad. It's, it's so of course, it's easy to say go to Estonia. But for 
this is with the, te the capital gains tax is 12%. Uh, when you uh, when Estonia advertises, they say it's zero percent. It is if you don't take the money out, but if you take it, it's 20. So creation 12 is still pretty good capital tax wise. Also, I don't know any company and I represent some of them uh, who have had like a, inspe a tax inspection terror and someone trying to step on their toes. Uh, so, so I think situation is overall good. And what Luca is saying, I agree, but I think we did make some progress uh, with Ubik for the last two years or so. Uh, I tend to agree. Fair uh, enough. Let, I mean, let's, uh, let's also get uh, Nicola. Eddie here to uh, join in. Eddie and, and Nico, yeah. yeah. And Nicola, please. Gentlemen, if you can unmute both yourselves and just have at it. What, what do you think? Yeah, sure. Like, I'm not that much affected, basically, with, with the, I am. I'm basically running a, a software company, but it's software development, basically, from the legal side. So nobody knows that we actually build the blockchains. And once I had an anecdote when I went to the tax service and asked them, okay, can I, you know, charge services in Bitcoin, Ethereum, stuff like that? And she was like, what? Is that that kind of scam? Okay, no, 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 it's not a scam, you know, but, but the, the approach like two years ago was like that, like what Lachos said, but we are getting forward basically. What I also see, I don't know, like, like law is not my jurisdiction, but the general uh, like audience and people are getting, you know, are more approachable and they are more open to this now than they were a couple of years ago. Like that's just my personal opinion. So basically, you're a crypto anarchist, and you don't care uh, about the jurisdictions at all. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. What Something about you? Like that? Uh, yeah, if I if I may. Um, so I um, I previously mentioned that the regulation brought a lot of good for us because. Um, uh, it's much easier to find uh, banking partners now, but that uh, that's true basically for European Union. Uh, in Croatia uh, proper, this is still uh, really a big problem, and this is really really important topic to talk about because uh, what many people don't keep in their uh, mind is that uh, if we uh, crypto brokerages uh, or crypto exchanges. Uh, cannot secure a bank account this basically means that a uh, whole crypto uh, scene and whole blockchain space gets uh, detached from uh, from the real world so eddie for instance can uh, can build applications and luca can fund projects uh, which basically end up in in a bubble if we do not connect them to uh, to banking and uh, while uh, we did see some progress uh, when regulation um, kicked in uh, basically banks started um, started answering our calls uh, which uh, which was really hard before uh, we started talking to banks after after the 1st of January and after the implementation of AML D5 but uh, unfortunately answers are still mostly no there's uh, only one bank in Croatia uh, that is prepared to work uh, with crypto the businesses Claudia, what does that mean? So, Luca, you hear me clearly? Uh, sorry, maybe it's me. Okay, cool. Uh, so, yeah, there's only one bank prepared to work with crypto companies, and this is basically just you know one or two crypto companies. I think only one crypto company, except for us, has a secured bank account because uh, they they really that bank really went on on the rim and uh, did a really really in depth inspection of what we are doing and took a risk uh, because. Uh, as uh, we, uh, although we are regulated uh, in the field of a AML, uh, banks and regulators still don't understand completely what we do and what risks are there. Uh, so yeah, it's it's really hard because if uh, if the banking policy uh, towards crypto changes for this one bank in Croatia, uh, we'll have some really 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 serious issues uh, allowing crypto projects in in Croatia to, to basically move in and out of uh, fiat, which which would be a disaster. So yeah. Um, Doing doing crypto business uh, in Croatia is not that hard. Um, it's um, yeah, the legislation could be a lot worse. Yeah, uh, uh, that the fact that nobody cares uh, is is a big part of it. But uh, our regulator, Croatian Financial Authority. 
Financial Services Authority is starting to care really, uh, really much. They are starting to ask really, um, um, really smart questions, and they are starting to educate themselves on the matter, and they are approaching it correctly. But uh, while uh, while we don't see uh, uh, improvement in the space of banking, I think that we are still uh, in really hard, hard situation. Interesting. Um, you, you know what, Ziga, are you... Oops. You muted yourself, Gordon. So let me unmute you. Sorry. You know, it's a, it's a hazard of... <laughs> I, got, I got a screen with sunlight built on it. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit impromptu. Uh, Ziga, I believe, is a attorney from Slovenia. Slovenia. So Big I'm going to... Uh, Ziga, if you want to... I'm going to unmute you. Uh, show your happy face. And, you know, we can do a, we can do a jurisdictional death match here a little bit. Um, there you go. Ziga. Hi, guys. Hey, um, Hi. are you able to do video or not? No, no. So sorry. I think okay. the, the connection is is a bit weak. It's okay. So just, I, I want to make the show about Croatia, but you, you did put something interesting in the chat. So just kind of give your fast perspective on the, the, the Balkan jurisdictional battle. battle. Yeah, I think I think uh, it's it's not so much a difference in regulation, basically. As so, what happened in Slovenia is that the regulators said, "Yeah, we're not competent to uh, to basically uh, delve into tokens to to regulate Bitcoin." So everyone was basically there was a, a free pass and most of the teams most of the teams went abroad to conduct uh, ICOs or build their projects they were so um, but, but they were mostly based in Slovenia or um, like they, they based, would on corporate somewhere else but like from from what I know a lot of them a huge part of them were Slovenian based people. yeah yeah based uh, either based in Slovenia uh, or partially based abroad. So um, I think um, they basically did uh, jurisdictional arbitrage, uh, a good good old thing that everyone knows. Um, but of course, with the with the AML directive, with the fifth AML directive, the level playing field is now getting um, is now getting the same if for Slovenia, for Croatia, for basically each EU, EU country. It depends on the implementation, of course, but um, I think we'll, we'll gradually get the same level playing field. All right, Zika, I appreciate it. I, I'm going to put you back on mute, but I just want to get your two cents because their comment was interesting. Well, let, let, me, let me kind of pass this to you, but also let me add in there, you know, can you talk about uh, Ubik, if I'm saying it correctly? Because I, I think you're very active not as like a passive recipient of regulation, but actively trying to form the environment in Croatia. Can you talk about that organization and what you're trying to accomplish? Sure. Well, we started off trying to become like a self-regulating body, which might sound a bit pompous because that was the coverage we got in the media. But the idea was to pitch the, as you said, to be proactive, to pitch the proposals to the regulators. To We even went to the Croatian parliament. Uh, trying to be proactive in order to uh, to channel how the regulation or at least how the feeling of the regulators towards crypto will be. So one of the things we we did uh, uh, early on, uh, and it was uh, it's something I'm reading what Ziga wrote in the chat, uh, is that we found a part of a creation law that was it sounds it sounds like a time travel because it was written before Bitcoin existed. And it's on, in the lines of something like this. Uh, should a mean of payment be confined to a certain network, it will not be considered money, something like that. So we were re really, really happy about it. It was the time of the ICOs, and that's, we, we, we were never going to get anything in writing. But we did get a nod from the regulator saying, OK, you can use this particular line of law to, to justify why we shouldn't uh, consider what you're doing like a financial instrument or money or something like that so that's why we had a few icos in croatia that never got negative attention from the regulators some of them went through some of them went bust it doesn't matter but uh, we were able to uh, at least we were, we were able to uh, help them 
get uh, some sort of uh, legal perimeter that wasn't uh, always clear how it looked, but we went to the regulators first saying, look, these guys want to do ICO. We don't want to send them to Cayman Islands. They want to do it on a creation limited liability company. But since we're coming forward, don't use this as an excuse to, to jump them, to jump their necks, like let them be. And the regulator said, okay, we're going to monitor, but we're not going to be aggressive or anything. And that's how it went, actually. So that, 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 that are some first, uh, first interesting parts. Uh, I would call it a success. We did. It was the time of the ICO. So, you know, everything was uh, about uh, making ICO, do, uh, making them uh, achieve something. We also did an offline event, which was called Balkan ICO Express together with the Slovenians and Serbs. Um, however, yeah, I, I, I like the fact that Luca's smiling and nodding. Yeah, yeah to I say think that. he remembers that um, yeah. with uh, nostalgia uh, about mm. that. It, it, I think that was a huge success because we had 10 projects uh, who presented themselves to the investors and to the general audience. And we had, you know, like banners and everything. It was in the media, it was really good. And I hoped it was going to become because the it was supposed to be the first of many but we didn't know ICO was going to be so short-lived. We, we, maybe we knew it wasn't going to live for long, but the second one was supposed to be in Slovenia, the third one in Serbia, and so on and so on. It didn't happen, but that particular one was a really good offline event, although the ICO thing went away. And the final thing uh, we organized, uh, when we had the last, last time we had an assembly, we, we organized the uh, voting on blockchain, and uh, that's how we picked the new board. Uh, and uh, ever since then, we had some big plans, but then as everyone else, else, we were Corona struck. So now we're, I wouldn't say we're in hiatus, but we didn't have any offline events, of course, ever since uh, March or maybe even even February. Yeah. Be believe me, I feel your pain, but you know, there's yeah, Zoom. Well, there, it's a Zoom world. It is. Days. It is. <laughs> so, or, my, or maybe a Facebook meeting room, who knows. The, so what UBIC? What what does that stand for? Um, in Croatian, it means Udruga, which is union. The acronym is the same. So Udruga Union for blockchain. Blockchain. I is like N and and K is crypto in Croatian. So okay, union and, for blockchain and crypto. We we write crypto with a K, not with a C. That's the only difference. I, I like it. It makes it look harsher. Uh, and it, it's you also you know the, the Philip, uh, Philip K. Dick's book. Uh, it's called Ubik, and you know, since we're all nerds, we thought it would be a nice place. I, I like, and you were one of the seven co-founders, uh, if I understand correctly, of Ubik, and chairman since 2017. Yeah, because uh, I, I, I'm definitely uh, out of the seven of us. I was the latest into it, and I know least of all of them. But let me quote, I don't know who was on, when we were choosing who's going to be the chairman, uh, someone said, it should be you because you'll probably find the time to do it. Like they, they thought, interesting uh, comment. <laughs> yeah, uh, there was another comment like you're tall and you're gonna look good on TV, which was of course only they were only flattering me in order to accept it. Uh, but yeah, I've been doing it since 2017. Very good. And you know, and you, you know, when we talked before the show, you, you made an interesting comment. I wonder if this kind of informs your approach to regulation. You, you like you mentioned, you were kind of late to Bitcoin. Not because you were anti it, but just because no, you, no. you didn't have your focus on it yet. But then when exactly. a friend explained it to you, your approach to it was you liked it because there's no penalty associated with it. No. It seems yeah. kind of related to your approach to regulation. Can you, can you talk about that? Sure. Moment? First of all, what you said, I didn't get the time. I wasn't anti crypto, but um, the thing, uh, it, if you're living uh, in the middle of a revolution, doesn't mean you will uh, notice it. That's what happened to me with like crypto and with the uh, internet, you know. We, we guys for my age, I'm 36. Uh, the fact that you're in the middle of the revolution, which was internet and crypto, doesn't mean you, you will notice it and take part. So I was I was a bit late to it. Uh, but this guy that told me when I I, I was I was I want to hear I want to hear the philosophy, not just the you know the money earn money by Bitcoin raising uh, uh, get surging in value. He told me, listen, this is the only the only only system in the world that doesn't involve any penalty. Mm. And me as a lawyer, you know, they teach you for four years, there's a crime and penalty. That's how it goes. You know, if you, for every aspect of your life, you know, if you, if you go to school and cheat on the exam, you get expelled. If you 
I don't steal something from the shop, you go to jail or you get fined, whatever. And I said, it's impossible. There's no system, let alone a system with so much greed in it and everyone trying to make money that there's no penalization. And he said, well, of course there isn't. And I said, okay, okay, but what if you want to do, that's when I already understood the fundamentals of crypto. I said, okay, but what if you want to do like a fake transaction? He said, like, no one cares. I said, how can no one care? They just ignore you. They, they know it's a fake transaction. And I said, but you're not excluded from the network. No, you're just free to participate. You can send thousands of fake transactions. The system is stronger than you are. That's why no penalty is needed. And that's when I thought there must be something to it when no one is penalized. And also I'm, I'm really not pro uh, copyright. And uh, he also, he knew that and played on that card. And he said, listen, you can even steal the logo. You can steal the, the you can fork off currency, call it Bitcoin Vlach or no one will care. The Bitcoin, there's no Bitcoin company who will sue you. And that, that's, I think I was sold there. I, I like it. And you know, you're, you're kind of radical for a lawyer, which is cool. No, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> radical. I just, I, I'm diplomatic. I said, I'm not really pro copyright. There you go. Oh, there you go. You're not against it. You're honestly pro it. You know, uh, fair enough. So let, let me, I guess, let me throw a random question to the group in general. Um, what, you know, I'm here, obviously. How has Croatia handled COVID? And also, what do you see COVID doing for blockchain and crypto? What's the intersection? So handle, you know, Croatia and COVID, and then how is it affecting the world generally in, in this area? And Eddie, actually, I'm going to pass it to you. Because you're you're sitting there like a Cheshire cat, and I know, I know you're having deep thoughts. So, well, yeah, like yeah, that's 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 a complicated question. Basically, uh, we had luck. Basically, we were closed like in March, or in, like yeah, we were like one of the closest countries that was like uh, like one of the closest countries in the European Union, and that's why like there are lo not a lot of cases and not a lot of deaths out of COVID in Croatia. Now we are quite open. There are a lot of tourists, and uh, like there was this big shift towards opening the country and everything. And I hope that this will stay like this, like it currently is. I'm not an expert in this field, so I wouldn't like to, you know, to talk about the medical sides of and that and stuff like that. But on the other hand, what COVID has provided or brought us is remote work, and which is awesome. You know, working distributed from whatever part of the world you want to work in. For example, like Split, Croatia, whatever. This is the perfect well, one of the rare places in in that has this warm climate, this awesome climate that you can live and work for anybody in the United States, in Europe, Asia, whatever. You know, and that's 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 the 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 thing that COVID good thing that COVID has brought us. I don't want to talk about good sides of COVID. Of course, it's don't want to sound you know don't want to sound like that. But yeah, that's definitely sometimes digitalization uh, usage of uh, networks like this. I think that COVID has definitely pushed us towards the future. You know, it 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 speeded up that that moment towards that. That sounds about right. I think maybe COVID accelerate the future by five years and it's a different future so it's, it's yeah, kind of funky uh luca yeah. what's your what's your take on croatia and covid and what what covid is doing globally i don't know i mean uh croatia and covid it's i think we were lucky and uh, we're not smart we're just uh, bloody lucky because we were very close to italy and we would we saw like what a appeared to be like the black plague of you know of Italy going on in front of our faces so mm -hmm. basically a knee-jerk reaction was oh let's lock shit down everything and then as a consequence of this a lot of people I mean the war ended like 20 years ago and it's still very very vivid and even there was a lot of like bad things even before the war like shortages I mean we lived in you know in a communist country which had a lot of shortages so people really kind of bulked and lockdown and at one point in time i think this kind of compounded a little bit and helped the the spread and that's why we had such a low uh, impact but at the same time we kind of it's evident that like what we are right now is in the eye in the eye of the storm you know when the tornado you know runs and then you all of a sudden things calm down and then you say Phew, you know it's gone but then you're hit with the with the other part i think this is what's going to happen and you can see that by, let's say, the openness. I mean, Croatia opened up. There's a bunch of tourists walking around Croatia just so we can kind of fix the economy a little bit. That's one one aspect of this. So I I'm think doing you, my part. That's, that's yeah, of course. 
Yeah. And thank you for it. Uh, thank you so much. But at the same time, so what, what COVID is basically, so I'm a guy who loves new stuff, disruptions, like like the complete antithesis from, from Blanco or not Blanco or what Blanco says that lawyers are. So for me, like disruption is good if it leads to better things. And I saw like for the past, I don't know, 20 years that I'm, you know, in this economy, in this like world, I'm seeing a lot of imperfections, a lot of, you know, things that could be optimized and a lot of gatekeepers who don't want to, you know, don't want to fix things because they're strange to them. So technology is bad. Mobile phones are never going to work. Internet is never going to become a serious thing. All of these things I've been hearing my whole life. And finally, I don't want to, like, there's a lot of bad things happening as a consequence of COVID. But at the same time, now there's no other alternative spot to adopt remote work, as Eddie said. Uh, to adopt digitalization, digital transformation, all of these things that um, a lot of people, like the small majority, uh, minority of people were evangelizing for years, there's no way around it right now. And I think this will kind of hopefully uh, kind of swell in the next couple of months because, you know, one thing that this region is very famous for is queuing up. So we queue up for everything. Like if you have... I don't know, whatever you can imagine, all of a sudden you, you need to wait in line for two hours. You need a, a permit, you, you need 15 stamps, and you need to wait at least five hours in a, you know, to, to get a, so I'm really Sorry, that's the way things kind of, were or that's the way things are? No, this is the, the way the things were. Now their things are getting better because we were locked down for three months and then everybody switched to online. So things that were impossible before because of bureaucracy became possible. Can I just give and an example? Once, Sorry, Luca. Can I just jump sure. in? Sure. Uh, okay, so Gordon, before uh, COVID, uh, if we have, a, like, f for pregnant women, we, we have maternity leave. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in order to get, uh, like, you get some small compensation, woman, a pregnant woman would get a small compensation while, on, uh, while pregnant, and in order to get it from month to month, you had to physically deliver a piece of paper to a room 14 on the second floor, blah, blah, blah. Got it. And <laughs> if you fail to do that, you lose the right. Although you are, I mean, that woman is still pregnant, but if she didn't deliver it in her eighth month of pregnancy, she would lose the right. So, so that's it doesn't matter whether she delivers the baby, she just needs to deliver the paper. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay, awesome. So, uh, right. Also, there's no, there's no like, no one gives you any confirmation that you did or did not uh, give it, bring it in. So you, you bring it and they can say, oh, um, you didn't bring it. This doesn't happen much, but it's not a flawless system, you know. And then all of a sudden, you can just send an email uh, with a scan or a photo of this piece of paper or nothing or just, or just say, I'm a pregnant woman and they will just give you the, the money. So that we had... We didn't have like a gradual shift. We, we, we literally went from uh, paper, physical paper delivered in person to send whatever you want by email overnight. Although people, as Luca said, were evangelizing this saying like, please do introduce some digital. I mean, it, the country is getting digitized. There's no doubt about it. And our ministry of uh, what's it called administration who has a relatively younger minister is doing a good job but still the system is so old and so i read for instance i read today that uh the boeing 747s uh are, when you have want to update uh the software it's still done via floppy disks because yeah. it's impossible to change it you know it's it's so interconnected and i think that's one of the reasons but uh when but let me let me interject nicola with what do they upgrade the software for nuclear power plants do they use floppy yeah, or? I'll, I'll tell you. Nuclear uh, yeah, did, did yeah you there's know, no nuclear missile silos, silos in the U.S. Like the things with the big bombs. Not only are they floppy disks, but they're not the little floppy disks. They're like the big five and a quarter inch floppy disks. They're like yeah. you, want, you want to get scared? Look at a U.S. nuclear missile site. And there's Nikola. Go ahead. Yeah. So they don't use. Uh, they didn't use anything. They, there's no software in uh, in the power plants. Everything is uh, hard, uh, is electromechanical relays. Everything is hardwired, uh, which which is not bad news uh, because there there is no software rot. Uh, there is no bugs. Um, uh, there is no uh, you know uh, bad developers uh, crashing something with updates. It's just wires and magnets and stuff like that and. Uh, 
electronics. So yeah, it's it's much much safer than to um, and then if it uh, ran on software. Very analog. So, so you are so Jir guys, just, please let us not be famous last words. <laughs> okay, Luca. Just to connect it, just to connect it to, to what Balako is saying. In some instances, it's good that you don't have upgradability. Uh, but the fact is that we are living right now in this civilization, like the 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 the, 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 the I don't know what's the what's the English word for this, but like basically the all of the frameworks, legal uh, governance frameworks that we are using are 19th century. They were invented during 19th century with nation states and everything else. And so three centuries later, we're living in a hyper-connected society that uses technology as their epitome of God, and they're, we're still refusing to use the technology to its full extent. We still have some people refusing to take um, a contract which is not physically signed, or you're still having people like zero knowledge proofs are, 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 are like a, I don't know, like a, a double PhD uh, thesis for even the simplest things. So I think that the COVID situation will force some people to adapt. For example, Croatia and Slovenia, like Malta, like Liechtenstein, countries like that are very small. They have their economy depends on a very specific sub subset of things. So they survive and they basically thrive by adopting the, the precious and the most cutting edge of technologies. And I'm hoping that uh, COVID is gonna force us to do exactly the same. Not us, but the, 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 the ruling apparatus, the governing body, that they will say, oh fuck, there's no way for us to live in the you know, 20th century economy. Let's try to shift it to 21st. Let's try to figure out what blockchain can bring to this. Let's bring, I don't know, AI, digital transformation, whatever you can imagine, or, you know, or just one kind of horrible word for them, transparency in some of the issues. And let's try to kind of bring it, bring it to 21st century. So that's my hope. It is going there. Is it going to go there? If, if, if it's going to materialize, I have no idea. But, you know, like Giga said, Arbitrage. This is one of the things that's happening to nation states is within EU, what can happen is I can select any jurisdiction that I want. If I have an EU passport, I can move and relocate to any country and I can open up a co company there. So this is what they are not realizing. And I'm hoping that they're going to start realizing. Sorry for the rant, but as you see, I'm very... Uh, just add one thing. Uh... I'm the last person who will be pro-banking, but uh, one thing struck me, I was at the PwC conference and there was a gentleman called Victor Dodig, he's um, Canadian and he was the, then, I think still, is the chairman of the largest, I don't know what's it called, CBDC or something like that, largest Canadian bank. We were on a panel together, I was of course uh, shilling blockchain and crypto and he was being uh, like cautious, but he is not anti, I think th this bank, particular bank is considered like pro-blockchain bank in Canada. And afterwards, he told me, and he's like 30 years older than I am, experienced guy, and he told me, listen, there is one thing. Uh, he said, absolutely understand everything you're saying. Like, you send the money like this to the other part of the world, it's there in 10 seconds, it takes us three days. But the good things of a transaction taking three days is that you can actually stop the money going to the wrong hands if it was a fraudulent transaction. So there is something to this legacy systems being maybe not completely abandoned. Maybe we can still use some good stuff from there. Not, not literally uh, cut off everything. Like everything old is bad. Everything new is good. I, I'm not on board with that. Okay. Well, I'm seeing smiles. Eddie, if I, I probably, I'm probably butchering your name, but go, no, go it's ahead. Good, it's good. It's good. Yeah, I'm smiling because like, yeah, you have a swift transaction taking a week from United States to Euro to, to my account. And somebody says that's, you know, that's even not, you know, that's not due to technology, just the le legacy and everything. You know, technology currently, even with with everything we have, could be much faster. But why, if they can keep your money, trade with it, earn interest on it, and then you get it? Just, 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 just one example. But you know, that's maybe I'm too, too towards an anarchistic. But why do I want to keep my money on a bank for someone else to have it? Basically, I have a number on my account, but I don't have that money. With this centralized system, what we move towards is trustless, and that's the key here. That's why we are paying transaction fees, which are less, which are costing like generally less than what general transactions basically are costing. And then, so is guys, let me, it's a good conversation. Let me stop you yeah. one second. We're not stopping it, but we're also going to let in if they're able to join us. Uh, we got Pedro Rivera, who's a alumni speaker. We got Mike Healy and Marco. I know you're there somewhere. 
Uh, Sander, maybe you can help me find Marco if he's on. Um, Michael Haley from Univentures. I think most of you know them. Uh, one of Luca's buddies. I don't know who introduced whom. I think Micah maybe, I, you know, it's, it's like it's one big Tangle family tree at this point. Uh, okay. Mike, if you can join in. And Pedro, if you can join in. Oh, there's All Michael. Right, uh, there you go. Uh, hey, Michael. Michael, tell you what, as, welcome back, alumni speaker. Uh, say a little bit about yourself, and then you can chime in on COVID regulation and where we're all going from your nationals and global perspective. Definitely. I mean, I think I've, I've been listening to this entire session. I agree with a lot of it. Like, there's been so much digitization of businesses and businesses which have um, performed, like, s switches which would usually take uh, years and maybe even a decade have happened in a matter of weeks or months. So I find that really exciting. Also, the idea that maybe businesses are more open to new practices, um, they're, they're less complacent. So a lot of industries are being shaken up and I think it gives lots of opportunities for entrepreneurs and for people who can identify opportunities to, to seize them. Uh, thanks, Gordon, and sorry, happy, happy to be here. Well, hey, hold on, I'm not going to let you go. So you, you're, you have a certain global perspective that is playing out. Just real quick, tell us about WikiLeaks and what you're doing in Bali, because it kind of says your Definitely. global perspective on regulation a little bit if you're pushing back or if you're on the WikiLeaks side. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. So um, how I got into crypto, um, as Gordon mentioned, was I built the Android app for WikiLeaks in 2010 and helped fundraise for WikiLeaks using Bitcoin in 2011. So the, the government's actually froze their Visa, MasterCard, um, uh, donations, uh, PayPal, bank accounts. So they, they started using Bitcoin and I was helping to drive the fundraising there. Um, I think in terms of, um, as you mentioned, the governmental perspective and in terms of uh, organizations, I think the transparency and the accountability is really exciting. So I'm, um, I'm excited for, for, for basically individuals to be able to look at government spending and see exactly where it goes so no money goes missing or to even look at uh, corporations or funds and see what their portfolios are, where um, basically be able to follow the money. I think there was a really good point about um, the benefits of legacy, transaction, of legacy payment systems to be able to stop transactions. I think um, things like this can be built into um, digital asset systems. Okay, fair enough. And then, Nicola, I, I feel, you know, you look kind of like, you look like a cyberpunk with those glasses. It's kind of intimidating. So what's your, are, are you, are you cynical like Eddie? Are you, are you, are you positive and optimistic like Michael? Where, where are you in all this? Uh, well, uh, I've been, uh... I've been looking into this, uh, well, this, this discussion about leg legacy systems uh, and uh, the innovation the blockchain world brings is really interesting because I don't know how many of you are aware of the efforts of the uh, Financial Action Task Force, FATF, yep. to uh, basically bring the legacy uh, procedures into the crypto world. Uh, so uh, FATF is for those that that don't know, um, uh, over uh, international body uh, that uh, oversees uh, basically financial uh, regulators. Uh, some financial regulators are uh, members of, of the body, some are not. Uh, the US regulators are members, Croatians, uh, Croatian are not, but uh, Croatian regulators are, are, do you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, so, yeah, so Croatian regulators are not the members, but they're under influence because uh, European Union pays close, close attention to what FATF uh, has to say. So what they are building right now uh, is a framework for uh, virtual, virtual asset service provider or WASPs. We as a crypto brokerage would be one of those uh, for them to exchange information. Uh, so the first step in this framework would be for every transaction made between crypto brokers or exchanges uh, or other kinds of 
or, or wallets. Uh, that every every transaction has to include uh, uh, identifying information, so everybody knows who's sending uh, crypto to whom. If they are using regulated regulated exchanges, brokerages, and and wallets, uh, there has been some discussion about what uh, would the next step be, and it seems quite logical to assume that one of the next steps might be that we, the regulator, um, virtual asset service providers, would then be um, required to stop uh, doing business with uh, unregulated entities and stop accepting um, uh, transactions that do not have identifying information attach, attached to them. This would basically level the playing field for the, for the legacy institutions because then uh, crypto would not be anonymous anymore. It would basically be functionally centralized because we as uh, WASPs would be uh, central points of entry into the system and we would be bring identification and all of the legacy mechanisms uh, into it. So yeah, uh, crypto started basically as, as some kind of um, uh, anarcho-revolution, but it seems that the regulators, uh, at least uh, the international regulator, are working really hard to, to bring this, uh, the legacy procedures into, into the existing systems. Now, it, would, it will be really interesting to see how it develops, because a lot of uh, crypto basics uh, are, are tied to the, uh, to the anonymity and to simplicity, to, to ease of entry into the system. For instance, how can you use DeFi solutions uh, if you need to do it through brokerage. Uh, listing tokens on brokerages uh, is a process that takes weeks, if not months, uh, while, I don't know, uh, there's there's a token called YAM that had its initial uh, distribution yesterday, and th today it's already pumping, and it's like 200% uh, up, and uh, me and a few guys are looking into it and taking uh, part uh, in uh, taking part of this action if he, if we had to do it through i don't know coinbase or some other regulated entity like electrocoin my company our company uh, we would simply not be able to to take part in in this action and this revolution that is legacy systems and and uh, revolutionary technology that blockchain is providing uh, it's going to be really, really interesting development to, to follow for the next uh, few months and years. You, you broke up a little bit at the end there, but I, I think, Luca, the, 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 the crypto we said was YAM, Y-A-M or yeah. something? Y-A-M dot finance. This is one of the crazy... Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the crazy... One of the new yield farming project. Interesting. It started like less yeah. It's than it's. I, I took it just as an example. Yeah, I took it as an example because uh, it uh, it appeared uh, yesterday morning, uh, and it's all the rage in the crypto sphere. Twitter, uh, and if it was uh, YAM action only through our company, uh, you you simply couldn't do it because the flexibility and the speed uh, of development in blockchain space is simply. It's it's not compatible uh, with with legacy systems. Uh, so this uh, this effort to try to to stabilize crypto and move it towards. Uh, Just you know, when, when, when it, whenever Nicola cuts out, that's exactly what he's giving us perfect predictions about the price of Bitcoin. He tends to do that. Hey, hold on, hold on. I, I'm going to mute him because this system is so, something that's uh, happening without uh, without breaking crypto. Yeah, exactly. So, sorry, Nikolai, you're 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 breaking up there. Just hold, hold on for a second. We'll, we'll bring you back okay. on. Um, actually, and you know what? I'm going to invite Pedro. Uh, Pedro, our, our our man from San Juan, Puerto Rico, also a jurisdiction hopper, also a yeah. famous alumni speaker. Uh, just say hi to group and give us your impressions on on life and regulation. Hey, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, well, it's good morning to me to you guys. It's part of the afternoon, I'm sure, the majority of you, at least. Um, I'm here in San Juan, and uh, obviously we have some, some interesting uh, regulations here in Puerto Rico that kind of like gives us some advantages over the rest of the United States, but we're still heavily regulated by the SEC. 
Um, so I'm, I'm always interested in, in, in hearing of other jurisdictions that are becoming more favorable to crypto and different types of, uh, uh, of technologies in general. Um, and it's interesting how coronavirus will actually, you know, just push the world towards more of a, 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 of a digital uh, 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 lifestyle. I mean, we're all right now, generally right now, the majority of us in this room, uh, in the Zoom meeting, we would actually be at a conference somewhere uh, communicating. But because of coronavirus, now this is a lot more acceptable form of conferences, right? So um, it's interesting how our world has shifted. And I imagine regulations would be, you know, regulations, they're slow, man. They're slow everywhere. But the beauty of like, I heard a gentleman speaking earlier, and I'm sorry, I can't, I can't remember which one it was. But he was saying that... Uh, uh, the regulations in Croatia, he was anticipating or uh, hopeful that they would actually make the adjustments and shift to a more technology friendly uh, environment. Um, and being that Croatia is not such a big place, and it's not such a big government, you, you, you would be hopeful that they could make that shift relatively quickly, like the other jurisdictions that did, like Estonia, like Malta and certain other smaller places in, in the EU. Um, and, you know, obviously there's a lot of talent out there. There's a lot of developers. So um, from that perspective, it, 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 it seems hopeful. Uh, but I look at all of this as just a precept for what's coming. I think we have a massive bull run coming. And I think that, you know, you look at uh, this publicly traded firm. I don't want to bobble their name, but they just purchased $250 million worth of Bitcoin yesterday. Uh, the combination of that and just market sentiment all the way around the board is changing, right? People are embracing Bitcoin and digital technologies. And I think that we're headed for a massive bull run that's going to be, you know, really spearheaded by the DeFi movement. And I think DeFi is a new buzzword, um, like blockchain was in 2017. And, um, you know, obviously be weary of that as well, because as you can imagine, there's going to be a lot of scams that are going to come through claiming DeFi as well. Um, but no, I'm really excited about where we are as a space. And I think that we're headed for another bull run that's, that might actually be twice as big as 2017's bull run. Um, and I'm excited about it, man. Can I just add one thing to what Pedro said? Yeah, uh, go ahead. And what Nicola said about the EM and this whole DeFi being the buzzword, uh, I took some time over the weekend to test a few of these projects uh, just to see how how easy it is to enter and uh, how legit they look to me because it all reeked of a scam to me, at least some of these projects. And I've had a very pleasant experience. Uh, By the way, I don't know where you guys are, but it's beautiful. I want to come visit wherever Croatia, you are. Croatia, right my friend, now, it's the Croatia show. Good Lord, man. I want to come visit. As soon as this, all this Corona shit goes away, I'm coming. You're seeing this? Yeah. <laughs> and, and Marco, who I have on in a second, he, he's in the Caymans. So there's. Yeah, well, I yeah. live in Puerto Rico, so, some, so I'm used to the islands. But I like, I like, uh, yeah, I'm missing like real mountains with snow on them right now. <laughs> so, uh, so, well, go, go ahead. Yeah. So I was, I, I, I have no affiliation to any of these projects. So I, I'll just tell you my experience, which is something I think really uncommon in crypto world. Uh, I was, I was first uh, trying to see the ample for it. Uh, and uh, uh, M stable. I don't know if you've heard of these projects. So it was uh, not that difficult technically to invest. However, uh, when I was on the M stable page, uh, there was some glitch and error, and uh, somehow I was charged transaction three times. Mm. Transaction fee, sorry. So instead of paying ten dollars at the time, I paid thirty. And uh, mm. I just wanted to see what will happen if I uh, send an email to the, you know, info at mstable.org. And I got a reply from the CEO within 10 minutes or so. Uh, he CC'd his uh, lead developer uh, who answered an email within another 10 minutes. Uh, he said he was looking into it. And within a couple of hours, he said, listen, we looked into everything. We don't think it's on our side but we are refunding you the two fees that you paid and they've returned to my wallet these twenty dollars so uh, i was really pleasantly surprised because in, the, in this world if you know you usually don't get any replies and uh, 
when some transaction fee is charged twice or thrice, it's the end of the game and it's probably some sort of a scam. This scene, I was really ple pleasantly surprised by the customer support, actually. What project was that, sir? M Stable. M S T A B L E. Interesting. Uh, Marco, we've, we've been remiss in not having you jump in yet. Mr. Caymans, please speak. <laughs> Yeah, Mr. Kamen. <laughs> you know that's a curse, right? I haven't been able to leave this island since the end of February. Yeah, for you. My, 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 my heart's bleeding. Uh, yes, I know. Uh, a, a lot of the discussion that was going on, I don't know if you've been catching the parallels, Gordon, with uh, what we're trying to do with DevDAO. Um, mm. But it, a lot of it is the transition from command and control uh, thinking to decentralized thinking. And I don't see uh, the blockchain world adapting to the legacy world. I see the legacy world trying to find a way to integrate and ideally, of course, control the blockchain space. Mm. And that's where you find exchanges having to be regulated and uh, money transfer uh, licenses required for certain types of operations but they're not really affecting the blockchain unless blockchain adapts its actual protocols to those things. And I think there's a lot of resistance currently in the marketplace to not adapt the core, but rather just make some edge systems able to inter integrate. I think we need to bear that in mind as we move through this phase, because I don't see it as an integration phase. I see it as a transition phase where we're providing connections to the legacy financial industry only so far as we need to, to accelerate adoption, such that once we get to a reasonable amount of adoption, we, we can then turn around and say, all right, well, we don't need those edge cases. I mean, we'll keep them up just because, you know, there might be some people who uh, haven't jumped on yet, but the mainstream internal core, which would ideally have plenty of users at that point can simply operate without the need for gateways to the legacy financial system in a decentralized manner. Um, so, so let me and, for a uh, Luca just asked me whether I thought this was going to be a peaceful. Well, well, pause, for, pause for a second and we're, we're going to pass the mic back uh, yeah. to you. So I'm going to shoot this at Nicola and at Luca. And Nicola, one thing that caught my ear from our sort of pre-talk was you're doing the integration with the fiscal registers that I guess every business in Croatia needs to have. So you're the, the contrary case. I should, you know, I'm gonna throw up the panel in general because everyone's wanting to jump in here. But Nicola, you're kind of the contrary case to what uh, Marco's saying, which is you're, you're building that Oracle function, you're building the integration function. Just what, what's your take and you guys, everyone unmute themselves and everyone argue. But Nicola first. <laughs> yeah, so uh, our angle on this, uh, we, we are a bit more conservative on this topic because uh, we think our opinion is that this, this cannot be done outside of the existing system because people have to pay taxes, uh, people, um, there, I, I simply do not see the future uh, in which uh, the connection to the legacy world uh, stops being relevant uh, because uh, countries are regulated by governments and the governments need to control uh, the flow of money. Uh, and governments do have uh, quite a number of tools uh, to keep the, uh, keep the control um, um, uh, above this, uh, this, uh, those flows of money. So for instance, if everybody starts uh, uh, receiving paycheck in crypto, uh, this, this, this would simply uh, tear down the whole uh, system of controls that government has over gray and black economy. Uh, that, that is the reason why in Croatia you cannot receive paycheck um, uh, in, in any other way except through a bank account. So if uh, so there is simply no technical way for everybody to move because you cannot receive your paycheck in crypto. Uh, so uh, I don't see this, this uh, evolution from a legacy-centric uh, world to a crypto-centric world without, you know, uh, openly at 
antagonizing governments and they still do have much more power uh, than we uh, in basically a startup world uh, have. That, that's why I think that uh, integrating with the existing systems is basically uh, a way to go because there is uh, no other way to go. Uh, because if we want to be relevant in five years, uh, we simply have to, you know, try to subvert the system from the inside because if we uh, if we try to be on the outside of the legacy system we simply will not be able to move into mainstream that, that's my personal opinion no i'll just go across the order that's on my screen which is eddie can i fight sure. go, go, go. Marco yeah, and then eddie. first then i'll, I'll jump <laughs> Yeah, like definitely, like Nicola is another position. I'm a developer, and I'm closer to a lot of these people. So maybe, yeah. but I believe that these are two different systems. Right? Like, you have like all this DeFi movement, the decentralized system and so, uh, systems, and so on. And you know, those are the blockchains that we know. But that technology can also be used in a centralized, centralized manners. What it brings then is a question, basically. Why do you complicate existing uh, models and what do we gain by, by centralizing this system? What is the added benefit of it? Is it faster or what do we get by it? That's, that's the main question. If we centralize the blockchains, what do we get about, out of it? Well, that's the main point. We don't get anything. They got everything. That's the main point. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's of the, the point, of yeah. Yeah. of the whole situation and i think this is a matter of if i can interject really quickly this is a matter of also the historic like cultural background like all of the guys here from croatia have you know lived through a communist system and then uh, a fall of the communist system and then a transition phase and then a very bad form of capitalism into a little bit more normal form of capitalism and for us there is no such thing as a peaceful transition so there's going to be a lot of struggle um maybe not on the streets, but probably below the streets that this either doesn't happen or this, this does happen. So I don't know, just my five cents on top of this, because I don't, I, I don't see this, you know, ending up um, in a very peaceful way, not to, to be on the arms. It's either going to be their way or we're going to find something uh, to kind of subvert that. So we are either going to find Monero 2.0 or Bitcoin, 4.5 that is going to be so more, much more advanced that they couldn't will not be able to to stop that so i don't know but marco you know you're welcome to well okay so um and i'm so i might please i apologize uh who's the guy in the sailboat <laughs> nicola nicola nicola, nicola. He, he is a nicola. right nicola was uh Nicola was talking about taking the conservative path and doing the integration component because to not do it uh, means adoption will never happen. Uh, it is not, in my opinion, not true that adoption won't happen without integration because Bitcoin was a classic example of adoption happening without integration. However, I do agree with him that it is the fastest route to get to adoption is to be integrated. So long as we understand that the core technologies we're talking about, uh, when we say DeFi, we're talking about decentralized finance, not finance that looks decentralized, but is actually centrally audited. Um, those kinds of concepts, if we keep the core ideals uh, in place and build solutions around them that allow for integration, but are at least in the minds of the visionaries who are building them, are a stopgap, a temporary solution to get us to adoption so that we don't need them. So I fully agree, build, build, build to integrate, integrate, integrate for now. So long as we maintain the purity of our ideals, which I know is difficult um, in the core, such that if we were to uh, somewhere down the road, turn off those particular interfaces, we would still be able to function as an autonomous decentralized uh, protocol for you know transfer of value tracking of, uh, of inter 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 interactions and, tra and transactions and those kinds of things and i think this is where you know with we've been coming across this with the uh the dev dow gordon is that you know the, we can't there's no re legal real world structure that is recognized as a dow on its own there has to be some sort of jurisdictional footprint somewhere that allows people to treat it as a real thing 
And I've noticed in our, in our ongoing discussions with governance and, and launching and granting and everything else, that this is, it is turning back into a command and control style. I mean, we still have the idea in our head, but we're allowing our, our habits of command and control to enter into uh, our architectures, if you will, for processes, procedures, and operations. And, and we need to constantly to remind ourselves that decentralization is the goal. Ah, well, hey, uh, we're, man, we're you, doing that right you, now. You, you know what? It's, it's not the Gordon show, so I'll, I'll be quiet. Nicola, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I completely agree on this with Marco. So uh, I think that uh, the, 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 the speed uh, of movement in blockchain space is... Uh, is so high that legacy systems or the regulators simply cannot cope with it. So we will always outpace them. So integrating with legacy systems, uh, I think is not capitulation. It's basically uh, subversion because uh, uh, accepting uh, some of the limitations that we have to accept right now, uh, just opens new space for innovation for, because blockchain is the first uh, I think the next step is the Internet point uh, 2.0 because the Internet allowed us all to communicate uh, and to connect and what block and uh, it does to be kind. Uh, yeah, uh, the first the, the, those who brought Internet to the mainstream the mainstream adoptions were telecoms and uh, were big legacy telecommunication uh, corporations and I need I think that we need that kind of cooperation in the finance world also when we also uh, got uh, layer two systems like for instance Wikipedia uh, which is not something that uh, could be grown uh, on legacy systems and that's something that couldn't be grown uh, if uh, internet was not mainstream so I think yeah that uh, we don't have to worry that uh, legacy systems or regulators will kill crypto because crypto and blockchain are so fast and so adaptive that uh, we'll, we'll simply outpace them Very much interesting okay I, I, as a lawyer <laughs> nicola needs to steer a bit more towards the coast <laughs> hey, you, 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 you just need your signal to noise filter installed and working ah, i mean look at that okay. scene that's that's beautiful that's epic <laughs> that's epic uh, you know luca i'm gonna pass this to you you, know, you you were so instrumental in forming this group and this panel and been so hospitable you know and you got I'll uh, just say, you know, lovely family, you know, good guy, organized everything else. I, I'm going to kind of pass it to you a little bit and put you on the spot and say, you know, what, what, what else would you, should we touch on in this panel? I mean, we've been pretty comprehensive, but you know, what crosses your mind or what projects are you following? And, and I also mentioned we have a gentleman, Gordon, uh, not, he was on the audience. He actually heard me speaking with the hotel manager about the show and he wanted to join in j just from the random coincidence. So, you know, Croatia has a community. I don't know yeah. if it's surface, but it's out there. So let, let me just kind of pass the microphone to you. Sure. I mean, um, I mean, I like, I, I really love these kind of discussions. Um, they're not happening that much in Croatia and, and, and as they should. Uh, I mean, it's basically just a bunch of guys like Nikolai, Edi, Vlaho, myself, you know, maybe like 200, 300 people uh, talking about these things. And, um, I don't think that uh, you know the, the the level of the expansion uh, uh, or the adoption is is high enough. You have a lot of speculators, which is fine, and you have a lot of uh, very small amount of people who are actually building something. But if you if you put them on, on one, like you have people from Croatia contributing to Ethereum, contributing to Aave, contributing to Near Protocol, like basically in their core protocol services. So some smart people actually got got in contact, uh, um, got involved there. Um, and I think that, I don't know, I mean, on, on, on the same, like, there's a lot of exciting things happening, just like YAM. YAM is basically a mock, mocking to the whole ecosystem right now, saying, let's form these three projects, let's form the fourth project, and let's see how much we can pump this. And everybody knows that it's a pump, but nobody will care that this is a pump. Because I know with, with whom Nikola is on the boat, and I know these guys are very smart and very deep into 
financial legacy financial technology and i know that they're freaking out about this and these kind of things are actually very very useful and as marco and nicola were arguing i i i had a thought as that exactly this is the case because the only way that we can avoid the let's say the 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 the, the or let's say achieve the peaceful transition is by outpacing them whatever we come up with whatever they come up with we can come up with something which basically circumvents um, Look, I, I just want to make sure things. I heard that. Outpacing, yes? Outpacing, yes, exactly. Outpacing. Good word. So basically, okay, I just, like it. Come on. Just, and, and this is one of the things that I realized, uh, like I was building startups and apps uh, during the app, you know, the whole 2007, 2012, 13 era. And, and this is exactly the same thing. Telecoms were trying to fight against the OTT over the top uh, apps and they couldn't because we would always outrun them. They would always outrun them. So... Uh, you had companies like WhatsApp, uh, you had like all these debates about net neutrality and telecoms trying to enforce like uh, tiers. So over the top apps like WhatsApp, Viber's communication protocols should pay to get their messages delivered. So I think this is the same thing happening right now um, in, in this space. And then, you know, it is from my, from, from my standpoint, it's very hard, but very awesome to kind of catch up with all of these things flying left and right. I mean, Yam is going to be yesterday's news tomorrow uh, because it's going to something new is going to come up and this is going to fail and this is going to explode just like Ampleforth kind of flashed. You know, it was awesome for a couple of weeks and then somebody else took its took its uh, example and then built on top of this. And I think that the, 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 this is essential for this market. Regulation is going to happen. It is inevitable. Mm -hmm. Look, it's currently a game of steal the spotlight. So mm -hmm. one project gets the spotlight, then someone else takes it away from it. The other one crashes. Then the third one, the fourth, I don't know. It's something from uh, take the spotlight to the game of musical chairs where someone will be left stranded <laughs> in the end without I a think, chair. Or, let me just I comment that, a, you know, it's Dubrovnik where a lot of Game of Thrones was filmed. And, you know, when you get a tra when you, you get really involved with your favorite character, that's immediately when they seem to kill that character. So there, there's a Game of Thrones aspect to crypto, which is, you know, <laughs> go ahead, Luke. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's a very nice analogy. I would add just one because one, like when these projects die, what happens, their DNA is absorbed uh, by other projects and it makes them better, more efficient, more like this is how you keep up the pace. There is nothing that, uh, let's say, the legacy system has on this. If we keep this pace, if we like, this is one of the things that I don't like Bitcoin or Ethereum maximalist because this is like countering to evolution, not, not evolution, but let's say to progress. One of the reasons why I ended up in tech is because constantly constant stream of fresh new ideas and things that needs to be built is is, is being brought brought into the, the whole space and i think that this is essential that you should adopt and absorb and and basically build uh on on top of all of all of those this is how internet started uh, not started this is how internet became what it is this is how all of the technology basically became what it is and i think that's the only way to go through through here and just play the, the game of catch up with all of them can you actually look at can you go into I feel, I feel like that this naturally feeds into meta change capital and what you're trying to accomplish like a meta change mm -hmm. capital i feel like it's an expression of this philosophy can you exactly go into this a little bit? so this is the, the the expression of the philosophy i've been in the vc space for a while classical vc space and one of the things that i'm seeing right now is like all of these things happening at the same time and everybody's chasing the same tail and doing the same thing and you have again the gatekeepers showing okay i have the money i'm going to give you the money and i'm going to wait on the sidelines and what you have right now is a, the world is on its tipping points technologically not like I'm not saying that there's going to be a huge revolution uh, on the streets in the next couple of months, but technologically, this is like the era when the smartest companies adopted the internet and the smartest companies adopted the mobile uh, revolution. Exactly the same, but magnitude times 10. And, but with a very important caveat, the, the, it's not just another technology because it provides a paradigm shift. So building a blockchain in crypto startup is not the same as building a startup on Amazon or building a startup on something else because, because it provides you um, a completely different mindset, completely. And this is where meta change. We believe that the, the meta game is going to change or is it or it's changing and whoever is going to adapt to it is going to be the titans of the new era. Whoever is not going to adapt to it 
is going to become the old grumpy two fellas from the Muppet Show, you know, arguing and saying that everything like the grass is greener before and then legacy systems were awesome and things like this. So that's meta change. We want to, we basically, all of my colleagues and my partners were exactly there. We built startups, we built blockchain protocols, we, we, we you know, my, my colleagues built uh, like classical finance systems. We want to kind of accelerate this a little bit because I think that, you know, the world that we're right now living in can be, can be improved always, you know, and, you know, that's, that's, I think that's, uh, that's kind of the epitome of meta change capital, of meta change. Yeah. Can I ask a question here, Gordon? Sure. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, Marco. Good. Um, I, I, it, it, this uh, brings up a topic uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm really curious about. Uh, you mentioned uh, that Ampleforth uh, sort of spiked and then vanished. Uh, and I kind of chuckled when I, I, cause I, I, I got uh, a little bit deep into Ampleforth just to find out exactly what they were doing. And <laughs> aside from some sort of a uh, minute to minute trading opportunities, Ampleforth's whole design was that your what you have today is exactly what you have tomorrow in terms of, uh, in their case, a US dollar peg, but done without the requirement for a reserve currency, which I thought was fantastic. Uh, because it was the one thing missing in terms of stablecoin in infrastructure uh, modeling was the idea that you had to maintain a reserve. Um, and when that, with Ampleforth, they maintain stability without a reserve. Now they do it on a 24 hour basis, which means uh, obviously for high speed traders, there's an opportunity to uh, arbitrage, but for longer term traders who are just using it as a base to hold um, non uh, volatile asset, uh, it was a brilliant design as far as I'm concerned. And I actually took, took their model and uh, played around with it and came up with a model that uh, didn't stabilize against the US dollar, but rather stabilized against the 25 most traded currencies in the world, uh, which caused a little more volatility on a currency by currency basis, but mirrored the Forex markets uh, in terms of general overall stability. Uh, so if money moved from one currency to another, that would be reflected uh, in the exchange rates, but it wouldn't change your on, on balance uh, value of your, your particular holdings. Marco, just because we're down And I looked at that and I thought, that is a solution. question. Sorry, buddy. We're, we're, down, we're down to like three or four minutes. Well, Can that's we the thing. The yeah. The, 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 the question is, the, yeah, the, the punchline is, how do you guys see the implementation of an infrastructure of that nature um, in terms of uh, how it could impact the overall crypto crypto markets in general, if if there was a cryptographic stablecoin out there rather than uh, just a peg uh, reserve cryptocurrency. So the reason why I said the Ampleforth is old news is because the concept from Ampleforth was taken, but some other project improved and then pushed forward. And Ampleforth is very innovative. It's very cool. It's deeply flawed, and we can go into that on a I don't know private private basis because I did the same. It fascinated me the way that they invented sure. the economy. But, you know, somebody took that concept because it was open source, took it, forked it, and built something <clears throat> even even better and then started pushing that. Can I just so, add one that, thing? Sorry. Uh, I've asked my friend who is an economy professor to analyze amples. They call it like sound economics or something. He analyzed it for three days and then he said, I'm going to tear apart my PhD diploma because I don't understand shit. And the man is an economy professor. So uh, if it's a scam or a Ponzi, <laughs> it's a well, uh, well based and uh, well fund, fund, foundations are good. You know what? It's probably more reliable than fiat. So there you go. Um, <laughs> now, I, I, I'm going to bring this to Sandra. You know, we, we kind of alternate leading this, this stuff. I've been yapping, or they've been yapping. I love when the guests run the show. And I love when the alumni speakers get into lively debates with the guests and you and I can sit back and... By the way, the, the amount of chats that came in during the show on, you know, it, it's like, you know, we're, of course, we're all in chat anarchy because I got Telegram, I got Facebook, I got WhatsApp, I got LinkedIn telling me, you know, hey, don't post in our group because you're more popular than we are. You know, like all that kind of stuff. So, I, you know, on one screen, I'm like fending off chats. On the other hand, I'm like, I, I love that the guests are running the show. So it's perfect. Uh, Sandra, I'm, I'm going to pass this back to you, my awesome co-host, the man in the Netherlands, the man in Amsterdam. Thanks. All yours, yeah. baby. Yeah, uh, thanks, Gordon. And I, I like to see that, you know, 
nine weeks ago when we just had this crazy idea of, you know, paying something back to the industry and getting our industry friends involved and just sharing ideas, you know, and networking. And remember when we said, you know, what if the show, if we could just start it up, just start a conversation and, and then the guests take over the conversation because it's all about them and not about us. And this is what's happening. So I'm, I'm really happy to see that. So before we close up uh, and, we, and we, we pitch a little bit towards next week, Crypto Wednesday, because that's going to be a special edition with a very special guest from another Asia. special edition, another special edition, yes. another special guest, but it's gone. Uh, uh, it's a, a guest from Asia market, from the Asia market, from Singapore to be precise. But first of all, I would like to thank all the people joining the call that were watching the live stream. So thank you for your attendance. And if you're also watching the recording, we also appreciate that. And if you share our YouTube channel on the link, you know, spread it to as much as people as you, as you can. We really appreciate that. I also would like to make a comment that uh, we received some really cool questions on the chat box, but of course we are not financial advisors. So we can give our insights, we can give our ideas, but we cannot give any financial advice because we are not financial advisors. So um, to summarize, I Wait, would let, let me just throw one thing, but uh, you know, sure. we appreciate everyone's interest and you know, it's kind of cool that I was discussing this with the hotel manager and someone caught wind of the show and now is on the show and just like, we, we appreciate everyone. We're, we're just kind of, we're, we're getting our feet. We're getting our sea legs with this, you know, this episode number nine. So there, there's a time and place for everything and, you know, m much love and much appreciation. Sure, sure. And, and the concept is like a work in progress. So we really, you know, appreciate feedback, insights, if you have good ideas, and this is towards our uh, speakers, our alumni speakers, but also to the attendees, if you have great ideas, which we can implement and show, you know, Send it to me and Gordon, and we're happy to, uh, to work with your feedback. But for now, besides the audience, I would like to thank Luca, uh, Idi, Nikolai, Flaho, and also our alumni speakers that participated in the second part of the show. So Marco, again, thank you for another attendance th this week. And also Michael Healy and Pedro Rivera. Um, so for now, Gordon, maybe on behalf of ourselves, we wish you all a great day, and we would like to invite you all to come back next week where well, we have a very special guest from Singapore, and I'm going to announce his name because this is one of my personal All friends. Right. And he's a big shot in the Asian market. He's a smart guy. He's a serial entrepreneur, a little bit like Luca. You know, he's building businesses all over the place. His name is, and he's my friend from Singapore, his name is Andy Leon. So most likely some of you will know him. He's, he's well, you, you, you're going to meet him. If you don't know him, join next week's show. We, we're going to introduce uh, him. He's going to share his insights on the Asian market. And I would like to invite not only the audience, but also today's speakers and previous speakers to join next week's call and to integrate and discuss with us on Andy's insights on the Asian market. So for now, I wish you all a good day. This is Sander de Bruyne from Amsterdam. On behalf of myself and Gordon, I wish you all a good day. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Great job, everyone. Really appreciate it. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye, Bye everyone.